Ed and I have prepared, I guess what you would call almost a duet of themes um, to kind of finish the day off. But before we do that, I want to make a few quick announcements. Um, firstly, a, a big thank you to really three people. So firstly, Chris Wilcox up in the box up there. There's a, uh, if we think it's been hot down here, it's been sure as hell, hot as hell up there. There's been um, three people doing our AV, but particularly Chris Wilcox, who's been up there all day helping to edit and put together our videos along with Lawrence Livermore and Demetris Kareas who's been helping with a lot of the admin. So I want to give them a big round of applause. So secondly, as you know, we've been doing a little bit of an experiment live streaming today to the web. Um, and it really was an experiment. And to be honest, I didn't really expect an enormous amount from it. My God, was I wrong. So we've got some stats on who's been watching online so far. And these stats are only from the first four sessions. So this is not counting the final session. Um, so uh, in total, over 300 people have um, looked into the first four sessions. The peak average viewing was 22 minutes. So the maximum that people were staying with us for was 22 minutes. And at one point, we had 50 people watching online. We've had a total, and again, from those first four sessions, not class, kind of the last one, of 141 hours of people watching. So um, that's really impressive. And I think it's certainly um, a signal to us that we should be doing that again. Um, one thing that didn't work out quite so well, and certainly those of you in the audience um, trying to connect your devices to our Wi-Fi, that's a big fail. So uh, uh, it's a common problem here, but hopefully we will get that sorted. We heard the, um, the presentation about the public Wi-Fi access. With luck, we'll, we'll, we'll get that one fixed in the future. Okay, so um, finally then to round off, Ed and I have done this um, rather kind of unusual, as I would say, duet, really picking up on, I think, um, what uh, and some of the themes that we have um, heard about today. And this is really to maybe inspire a bit of discussion. Maybe we're too hot to do much more discussion, but maybe just to kind of, it's really more of a speculation on what we think the museum would look like perhaps in 10 years' time, looking at um, uh, how we take some of this digital work forward. So as I say, it's going to be a duet. I don't know what we're not singing, yes, there's no singing, there's not even any poetry. But um, uh, for those of you who've looked at sort of uh, Ian and Justin's big narratives document, which sort of picks up sort of on our evocative past and maybe our potential future for our science, I guess it's a little bit like that. And for those of you that haven't, maybe you want to take a look at that document. So I don't know whether we should do this with two mics. Do a I'll proper just, duet. I'll stand there. Yeah. You stand there. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll make a start. So what would the what would a digital museum look like in ten years' time? So as an institution, we forged our dreams in a simpler time. We measured our success by things like the number of specimens in our collection, the buildings that house them, and the staff that worked here. But now, what was once the domain of a few people that could come to the Natural History Museum is the preserve of billions that have access to the internet. The internet breaks down these boundaries, so the outcomes that were once inconceivable. And now the routine. So like this PCR fridge magnet, for example. So we need new dreams. So we think we can tell a lot about someone's dreams by how they choose to measure them. So for an institution of this size, we need big dreams. So what does big mean for us? Our dreams must be scoped to include the entirety of the natural world, all of its species, past and present, what it's made from, and how all of these things interact. Our dreams need to scale from the smallest microbe to the blue whale. We can't afford to just invest in niches or fashions. And the pressures on our planet mean we don't have time to waste. We need quick wins as well as long-term solutions. Much of this is going to require new technologies to do this science. Metagenomics, for example, provides an entirely new window 
on biodiversity, allowing us to investigate organisms, genes, and interactions, and maybe challenge some of the very tenets of what we think make up the natural world. Technology also allows us to communicate in new ways. Our science will increasingly underpin public policy and public discussions, and we need to engage with people through platforms they're currently using, rather than invent our own. This means engagement at the right level. We can't assume everyone has the same knowledge or understanding or even interest. Some people need a broad overview, while others engage directly with our science. It should be for them to decide, not us to dictate. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Lots of good content already exists. and We can repurpose this, leaving us time to fill in the gaps. This needs to be inclusive as many of the people that need our knowledge the most don't even speak our language. If our mission is to inspire engagement and interest in the natural world, our target audience has to be everybody. And for some, this means genuinely participating in our mission. New technologies make this easier than ever. Creating rich data from new sources. Some of which won't even be sentient. We can increasingly automate field identification, collecting more data with less effort. New devices can take advantage of this, so that, so that perhaps in 10 years' time, your spectacles will become a heads-up display, which, using tools like facial recognition, may allow us to identify species. Leading to new opportunities for education and new platforms for delivering our content. And through this massive pool of data, new opportunities for research and challenge the way we do research in the future. So that everybody becomes a collaborator. Realizing this potential, the potential of these new data and collaborators requires new ways to behave where sharing becomes the default. So that we can begin to tackle big questions on a truly global, on a truly global scale. Enabling us to shape our future. A future where data comes in in real time. It's combined with what we know already, and with quick and easy analysis. So a task that once took months happen continuously and behind the scenes. New visualizations will allow us to make sense of these data, identifying trends uh, and allowing us to communicate them in understandable and compelling ways. So hopefully the answer to this question isn't just out of order. So what are our dreams? They're about collaboration and communication. In your language. Wherever you are. And perhaps we can distill this into a single research question. Maybe this question. Thanks for your time. <laughs>